Hi, everyone. Thank you for being with us this evening. My name is Sam. I'm the Community Engagement Librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, as the Community Engagement Librarian, most of my work focuses on nonprofits. I'm either doing programs for them or with them. And Jennifer Lucas and Go Green Barrington are some of my favorite to, to uh, put programs on with. So Jennifer approached me a few months back with the idea for bringing this program to you. She had seen it and was very enthusiastic about it. And so we have decided to move forward with it. And we're excited for you to learn from Ken this evening. I will let Jennifer say a few words about Go Green, if you would like. Sure. Um, my name is Jennifer Lucas. I'm one of the founding members of Go Green Barrington. And we started this small Go Green uh, group to raise awareness on various environmental issues, especially those that are outside the mission of the great land conservation groups in this area. So in two years, we have uh, twice co-hosted the One Earth Film Festival, put on programs on solar, recycling, reusing building materials, and much more. Uh, so I hope that you can look at our website, gogreenbarrington.org, and follow us on social media for our projects. And this summer, as Sam said, uh, my colleague Kat Gertz and I saw this light pollution program, and we were so excited that we couldn't wait to share it with all our friends. So I'm very grateful to the Barrington Area Library for co-hosting with us, and also to several groups in the area, the Village of Barrington, the Barrington Breakfast Rotary, the Daughters of the American Revolution, and the League of Women Voters, who all helped spread the word about this program tonight. Those groups are all trying to incorporate the environment in their projects, and uh, we support that action. Um, so uh, tonight, I'm very excited to introduce Ken Volchek. He is the Far Horizon Senior Manager at Adler Planetarium, and I'm sure he can tell you more, but Far Horizons connects students and the public with hands-on uh, science and engineering projects. He's also a delegate for the International Dark Sky Association. So I hope that you enjoy this as much as I do and that we will learn the impacts of light pollution and also what steps we can take to deal with it. So thank you for joining us, Ken, and uh, please go forward. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite, uh, Jennifer, Sam. Uh, thank you for any opportunity uh, to talk about this issue. Because um, I think uh, it actually opens people's eyes a lot. <laughs> and uh, pardon the pun, but uh, you know, hopefully I can help bring a little information to you that maybe um, you all didn't know. And I'm always open to questions as well. So without further ado, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about light pollution. Um, so, you know, I, when you hear a name pollution, you're always thinking like, oh no, not another thing to worry about. But the wonderful thing about light pollution that is it's actually quite an easy solution. <laughs> um, but you think like, well, why make a change? Um, hopefully tonight I can give you a little bit of reason why light pollution should be maybe uh, on the top of your mind. Oops, sorry, I, I'll get my, I might have a couple technical things here. There we go. Um, so as you know, light at night uh, attracts animals. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, if you really think about it, it's only been a century since lighting has uh, really been dominant in our uh, world. Over four and a half billion years of evolution has never seen a, a night without a moon or a, uh, being maybe the only illumination. Um, what you're seeing here is, you know, you're probably familiar with um, moths being drawn to a flame or to a light. Um, but what we have in this case this was actually through the Cornell Ornithology Lab, is a video um, from the Tribute and Lights um, that is done in New York City as a tribute to the 9-11 uh, events. They do it every September, around September 11th, obviously, which is kind of unfortunate for the birds uh, because what you were seeing there were literally tens of thousands of birds being attracted and drawn to the light. So it's not just moths it's almost all nocturnal species are drawn to light. Um, and what I was saying about the unfortunate timing is that, uh, for so many reasons, is that it happens to be at the height of migration season as well uh, for birds. Um, and I'll just get it, I'll get a little bit more into that later, but I just, that was like my little visual introduction. 
Um, so we think of light at night as sort of a, a luxury of our modern era, um, but it hasn't always been that way. And uh, I mentioned like all these millions of years of evolution uh, of all the plants, animals, and us um, that have always had a night and a day, a night and a day as the pattern of our biology, of our ecology, of our environment. Oh, by the way, I have to apologize. I live next to a hospital, so every once in a while you might hear some ambulances going by. Um, hopefully it's not too, too bad. Okay. Um, so the first thing that most people think of, especially we're urban dwellers, suburban dwellers, we're near one of the most light polluted uh, cities in the world. Um, the first thing you may think of is the, uh, well, the stars, the night skies. So uh, it'd be great if everybody had their video on, but I know you have the choice, but like a general show of hands for the folks I can see, who has ever seen the Milky Way with their own eyes? Yeah, I see a few, I see a few. Uh, um, as part of somewhat I do at the Adler Planetarium, um, we, we do uh, a thing called, well, when we were open um, before COVID uh, with the Space Visualization Lab was a place where a scientist could actually talk to the public. I would ask that question frequently. And uh, it's sort of a sad tale that um, I would say that if you're under the age of 40, you probably didn't raise your hand. Um, so oops, let's see if I have to, uh, because things have changed so much in our environment Let's see if I, oh, here we go. This is a photo I took from uh, the Sonoran Desert in uh, southeastern Arizona, where literally the Milky Way went from horizon to horizon. Um, and I, I love to travel just to get away from the dark, uh, from the city lights, just to see the stars. Uh, and when you have that experience, I feel it's quite moving. It's it's quite uh, impressive. Uh, you know. Um, Jennifer mentioned some of the work I do with Far Horizons at the Adler Planetarium. Uh, we work with light pollution and with students, um, educating, becoming, teaching them to be advocates as well. And also we do a lot of scientific research with instruments we build. Uh, one of the things we do is we take uh, our students, which are generally Chicago students, and we take them on a field trip. Sometimes we go to um, a dark sky park about an hour and a half south of Chicago. Or, uh, and then it, it's Middle Fork, um, it's called Middle Fork, or take them to the Indiana Dunes. For some of the students, literally it's the first time they've ever seen stars. And that shouldn't be. Um, but we know the reality. Um, this was an earlier trip I took to Gila National Forest. I literally just had a point and shoot camera um, and uh, made it, adapted it so I could take some nighttime photographs. This was uh, the view I got when I first stepped out one night uh, from my tent and shot a picture of the Milky Way looking up. I wanted to test my camera out though. So the night, two nights before I was up on my rooftop in Chicago and took the exact same camera, exact same exposure. And this is what I saw. Let's do a little comparison again. These are literally the same camera, the same exposure. This is what we see. This is what we could see. Um, just one, uh, fact that's come out from some research that uses global maps of light pollution is that because of light pollution, 97% of US residents cannot see the Milky Way from where they live. Uh, you know, the vast majority of people in the United States and across the world live in or near urban environments these days. Um, and urban environments obviously are the ones that are producing the most light pollution. Um, but the, for us, 100% of Chicago residents cannot see the Milky Way from where they live. On this gradient we're seeing here, um, we'd have to be, I took out everything, uh, the, where, where the color is, is where you could not see the Milky Way. So you'd have to be in some of the clear area to be able to see it. So from Barrington, you'd probably have over an hour hmm, drive maybe to even get close to an, a place where you could maybe see the, the Milky Way. And it didn't always, like I said, wasn't always that way. Um, so the night skies, yes, uh, the, there's obviously uh, something that we're losing there. Um, for me, who works in astronomy and also uh, with uh, the public, um, actually having the opportunity to see the Milky Way is our connection to the universe. Um, but there's so much more. Uh, you know, you could say, well, maybe that's not um, a um, tangible effect to my life when it comes to the impacts of light pollution. Well, 
ecological research. Um, and by the way, this is a relatively budding science. Um, it's only been about the last 30 to 40 years that uh, we've actually had data that we can start to learn what the effects are of uh, light pollution on our environment. Um, most uh, folks have maybe heard of the effects of um, uh, young turtle hatchlings, sea turtle hatchlings in Florida. That was one of the first studies that came out that showed a direct impact uh, of light pollution on animals. Um, I think it was started really in the 70s. And what they noticed was um, these uh, um, hatching sea turtles uh, would go toward the light. And why would they do that? Why would a sea turtle, uh, you know, a new, new, newly born sea turtle go to the light when they're trying to go to the sea? The reason why is because imagine a world without light um, at night. Now, you know, they're very, uh, um, prone to predation at the time when they're, they're born, they need to run to the sea um, as quickly as possible. And in a pristine environment, the brightest area would be the ocean. It's reflective, the stars reflect off it, the moon reflects off it. And you wouldn't think that the same thing would happen for you know, grass or, or sand and things like that. So that's how they find, find their way. Obviously, if you see a street light, it's gonna out, uh, uh, out <laughs> shine the moon and it overwhelms their senses and it literally draws sea turtles away. Um, mitigation factors were put in place um, since the study came out, uh, I think it was like I said in the late 70s, early 80s, and it has improved the environment a lot. Oops. Um, but the, the, that was like what I mentioned was one of the maybe the first uh, hard impacts of light pollution on uh, a species was. Um, this is, you notice, um, this is September 10th. This is, um, uh, this is a radar image of the United States. And what you're seeing in the radar, you're used to probably seeing radar and uh, daily weather forecasts reflecting off of clouds, uh, seeing you know storms coming in. This is actually the intensity of birds. There are so many birds migrating in September, which is the, obviously the fall migration, they actually get picked up on radar. All the green dots you're seeing are active radars, weather radars. And now what I'm going to play is a video here. Um, and you see the red line over on the East Coast? That is the line of sunset. So now I'm going to play this video and you'll see the setting sun. And look, let's look what it does to migration. Now, before I do that, um, take a look at the scale down here. It's a logarithmic scale, which means every uh, increase is a multiple of 10 to the previous. So you see some of these areas maybe around the corner of Missouri and Tennessee um, is somewhere in the range of maybe a thousand. And what I mean by that number is a thousand birds per kilometer within an hour. So within a kilometer of that radar, we're seeing a thousand birds moving within an hour. So now if I play this video, we'll watch sunset over the United States. we're literally seeing tens of thousands of birds per hour, per kilometer migrating. And you notice where their migration pattern is. As the sun rises, by the way, you see that start to drop off. Um, of the over nearly 650 bird uh, species native to North America, over half of them night migrate. And of 60 over 60% 60 of those migrate at night. Um, so at the height of migration season uh, in the spring and the fall, there are literally tens of millions of birds passing through the Midwest uh, every night. Um, beyond that, uh, this is a, I try to always update my slides as much as possible. Um, this is a photograph uh, from Iowa. And I saw it on Twitter and I contacted the person who took it and I said like, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, they, they mentioned what it was, but it's like, it looks like a pixelated photograph. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting Instagram filter, right? Well, this was actually the um, mayflies uh, spawning, um, and they are actually mating, I should say, uh, at this time. Mayflies, you'd think like, um, well, who cares about a mayfly? Well, if you're a fisherman, you should care about mayflies because fish have a, uh, in a sense, they need mayflies as a really important part of their food chain. And uh, if you know anything about mayflies, um, they actually have a lifespan, an adult lifespan of one day. They have one night to mate and that's it. 
Now you can imagine if you're, you know, uh, in a pristine environment, they would all be at the where they where they. By the way, I'm not a not an ecologist, but uh, um, they would all be where they're um, uh, um, living mating and that would be the cycle that they need to replenish the species. Um, obviously when they're drawn to light that disrupts this entire cycle. Now you'd think like, okay, maybe mayflies are my favorite thing in the world, but it, as those downstream effects quite literally affect the, the rest of the food chain, uh, it does actually have quite an important um, impact on the rest of uh, uh, the ecology of systems like this. So um, in a recent um, talk, I saw this, uh, researchers out of Denver said, hmm, um, you know, moths, okay, let's talk about another insect. Well, you maybe don't think too much about moths other than, uh, you know, some, some of them are pretty, some are, you know, interesting, but they're also incredibly important pollinators. Um, and also they're incredibly uh, uh, fundamental part of the food chain as well. Um, and what they found in their research is that um, they looked at the local environment in small grass areas, um, in a sense like uh, um, uh, small, uh, I should say like reserved grass areas in De around Denver, um, where they counted the not only the population, but the diversity. And uh, also they realized they should be looking at the plants. What they noticed is under artificial lights where they had uh, areas that had lights directly uh, above them, the plants actually were altered. And how uh, she, uh, uh, Shannon Murphy described it in her talk was that the plants, uh, these grasses and uh, natural um, uh, prairie grass type uh, species actually became tougher. And what that ended up being is uh, she gave the insect equivalent of junk food. Um, it was, they were not as rich in the nutrients and the sugars and things like that, that um, the moths would need. So it actually impacted certain species of moth. So it lowered the diversity and also um, weakened those that were uh, indigenous. Um, so the, as she mentions in this uh, abstract, the community-wide consequences are actually quite interesting. Uh, um, it's, it's beyond just the creatures that it affects, but it's also all the downstream effects. Um, so, so many others, everything from bats to, um, you know, plants to a fish, uh, zooplankton. Um, there's been research that is showing that it's a very broad effect on uh, light pollution has on our, e the ecosystems, natural ecosystems in our world. Um, remember, this is not a natural cycle. This up until nearly only a hundred years ago, there was a, what's called diurnal uh, night to day cycle. Um, and so that kind of brings up something. Well, we're an animal. We are so used to um, illuminating our world at night. Does this actually have a negative uh, impact? Um, so far, the researchers seeming to say yes, and worryingly so. Um, uh, I was actually just involved in a uh, UN conference that's going on this week, uh, uh, crafting uh, what hopes to be a guidance uh, world guidance for uh, light pollution in in, uh, in the future. Um, a uh, biologist, uh, or actually medical biologist, uh, spoke about the impacts of light at night. Remember, I said that there's we have this natural cycle. I'm not going to show you too many graphs today. So, <laughs> so, um, and um, by the way, if, if I'm getting a little bit of warning that my internet might be a little rough, let me know if it's if it is. Um, one of the the um, most important markers that's natural to us is our melatonin production. Um, it's maybe a little hard to see on this graph, but uh, um, that red line uh, has the melatonin production within a normal human cycle. There's kind of a gray bar in the middle. Uh, it begins at sunset and it ends at sunrise. And you notice that spike in melatonin production at night. The only way we produce melatonin naturally in our body is at night. There's no other mechanism in our body. And how does the body know it's night? Well, light. Now, um, what's interesting is we've always thought, okay, well, we have uh, the sun rises, it's bright, sun sets, it's dark. Um, and that seems to be, you know, we are, you're probably used to your rods and your cones. Uh, you know, rods uh, detect uh, color, uh, cones detect, or they reverse that, sorry. Um, uh, um, light uh, at a darker level. There's actually a third um, 
visual uh, sensor in our eyes. Um, that actually triggers our melatonin production. And you can see there are other things that are downstream effects of a light and that. Now, I wanna mention that third unique um, uh, sensor in our eyes, mainly because it's very sensitive to blue. Now, why would blue be a link to uh, melatonin production or the, the nighttime cycle? Well, if you think about it, we have a blue sky. It's not necessarily the sun, it's the blue sky that's the trigger um, for our knowledge, our uh, biological knowledge of night versus day. Um, I use this photograph because a transition to another health effect because if blue is the thing that's triggering our uh, melatonin production, and by the way, melatonin has uh, many uh, uh, known effects in our body of regulating, for example, um, fighting against cancer uh, and also in uh, um, other biological effects in our bodies that are going to be, in a sense, um, not controlled if we don't have that natural melatonin cycle. Um, I use this example of an image from a police cruiser who's just pulled over to the side of the road, uh, took the photograph, and you can notice what do you see across the entire screen is blue, a glow of blue. Blue light scatters more than uh, warmer lights, um, lights in the reds or the oranges. Um, that's why our sky is blue during the day. The light from the sun the yellower light comes down through the atmosphere, the blue scatters. So, I mean, there's a, there's a known reason why, for example, a police cruiser has blue uh, flashing lights is because it blinds you. And the, one of the things that uh, happens in our eyes naturally um, is we get little calcifications within our eyes. They say like, once you hit about the age 50 and onward, those calcifications grow and sometimes they actually cause cataracts, but it's a um, process in our eyes. Now, if you have calcifications in your eyes, these little specks, it's the same as our atmosphere. It scatters the blue light. Um, so what happens is uh, as we age, uh, the bluer the light, the more it scatters through our eyes and the harder it is, for example, to drive at night. Um, if you're older, you probably notice that where you're like, you know what, I used to be able to see clearer at night. Well, it's the scattering light uh, in our eyes. It doesn't happen as much during the day because there's usually uh, a, a lower frequency light that doesn't scatter as much and there's not as much eye strain as well. So ironically, the 2014 Nobel Prize uh, in physics went to the invention of the blue LED. Um, the blue LED was actually, before uh, this was discovered, um, LEDs, if you remember back in the day, were kind of always kind of a reddish or orangish color. Um, it took a whole different kind of science to create a blue LED. Um, you're like, oh, great, we have a light that could be whiter. Um, now, in 2017, like I said, ironically, the Nobel Prize was given to the discovery of that unique sensor, that new sensor in our eyes that was never before uh, known that actually controls our circadian rhythm, uh, our, our sleep cycle, our melatonin production, uh, cortisone, et cetera, et cetera. So um, put these two together and you start to see a little bit of a problem. If we have the technology now to make a bluer, bluer light, and yet um, we now know that bluer light, and when I say blue light, it doesn't have to be like that police cruiser. It could actually be light that contains some blue in its spectrum. Um, so this is just a little bit of a conglomeration of some of the most recent research um, from, you know, about the last less than decade, to tell you the truth, of some of the studies that have been done associating light with health effects. Literally everything from uh, incidences of breast cancer to sleep disruption to um, uh, obesity. I just kind of want to point out one of them uh, in particular. Um, let's see if I got my... Um, so this was a study that was uh, published just, I think, two years ago. Um, and I wanted to point this one out because it's actually a little surprising. Um, what they found, this was actually a, a study of over 100,000 subjects uh, self-reporting their environment, uh, their light exposure, and their health. Uh, and they also had many, many metrics that they measured. And I find this uh, one pull quote that I had from this kind of interesting, because they found an increase in obesity, uh, they were studying women in this case, um, among women who were exposed to more light. Now, this is not just light outside. 
this is actually literally indoor light or exposure to screens or, you know, you can imagine, you know. Um, and I found this uh, one of the most interesting pulls from that. It was, it, as it says, among women who consume diets with a higher score on the health eating index, a higher quality diet, and who repeated, uh, reported more leisure time physical activity, the association between Allen, Allen, by the way, is artificial light at night, and weight gain was stronger. So uh, it actually impacts even healthier women more than those who are maybe already have other uh, prevailing uh, counter uh, um, uh, health issues. Um, I thought that was quite interesting on that, but oops, sorry. Let me... Now, so now we're coming down to, okay, what's the bigger picture here? Um, there's an economic impact to light pollution, obviously. Light costs money. Um, use this example. Um, there's a researcher we work with out of Berlin. So uh, we've shared data a lot. And um, he pointed out something to me that um, Berlin, um, this is seen from a satellite, by the way. There's a satellite that orbits the Earth uh, every night, it takes an image of the Earth, and we can actually quantify the amount of energy going out into space. Um, what you're seeing behind me, by the way, is from the International Space Station. Uh, it was one image they took of the Chicago area. Um, this is a little bit more of a, a scientific instrument which measures the intensity. You can add up all that intensity and get a, um, a number on how much energy is being used. So I use Berlin as a good example because um, the populations are very close. Uh, these are both at the same scale, by the way. Um, and you can see, hmm, it seems to be a lot more on the Chicago side than there is on the Berlin, Berlin side. So just to let you know that um, the budget, this is just of Chicago, not of just the region, but the budget of Chicago um, for lighting at night uh, is the equivalent of the, uh, oh wait, I should say, I should go back, that the entire budget of Berlin for lighting their entire city streets at night is the equivalent of the energy uh, wasted into space from Chicago. So let me repeat that. It's What I mean is they light the entire city of Berlin for what we waste in Chicago. Um, if you could see it from space, it's not a street light, it's a skylight. So uh, hopefully that makes a little sense. So um, Chicago spends $20,000 per hour every night lighting. Uh, this is just street lights. Now, this isn't even taking consideration commercial lights and um, um, private lighting. And oops. so that all adds up to, I just wanted to use that as one example of the amount of energy use to be very inefficient. Um, do we need all that light? So, so far we found that like, hmm, it impacts our uh, ecosystems, it impacts ourselves. Um, what about the bigger picture? What about the climate? So the Department of Energy estimates that the US alone uh, uses 143 trillion uh, watt hours of energy um, for commercial, now this is commercial and municipal uh, outdoor lighting every year. Um, that's just outdoor lighting. And that e equals the energy use of the equivalent of 85 million tons of carbon emissions. Sometimes I work in astronomy, sometimes big numbers are really hard to wrap your head around. So I always like to kind of maybe give a, a little bit of a um, sense of scale. 85 million tons of carbon is the equivalent of 13 great pyramids of Giza sent into the atmosphere every year, just from outdoor lighting in the United States alone. Imagine the carbon footprint of that. Um, so quite often when I spoke, especially if I speak to uh, decision makers in governments um, and they're saying, well, we need light for safety. You can't have dark streets um, because they're gonna be unsafe. Um, so here is a, a photograph of my street I came home from an event at the Adler Planetarium. It was about 10 o'clock at night. And the first thing I did was, uh, and didn't even notice what was going on, why it was seemed unusual to me, but okay. Seemed pleasant enough. I got my dog, took the dog for a walk, waved hi to neighbors. Um, you know, we talked and, you know, and then it was like, wait a minute, then it struck me. It's like, oh, I found out there was actually a film shoot 
uh, by the way, this is like last year, there was a film shoot down the block where they requested the streetlights be turned off. Um, and so it's like, oh, I had an opportunity because you always want before and afters or you know comparative uh, uh, data when you're a scientist. Um, so I came out and took a whole load of photographs. And then about two hours later, about midnight, they turned the lights on. Now, I want you to visually look at the scene and see if you're, you know, I think if I saw someone walking down the street or a car coming by, no problem identifying. Our eyes are amazing instruments. We have an amazing dynamic range within our eyes. It's like a window, but that window can shift. This is what it looked like two hours later. This is what it normally looks like on a Chicago street um, at night. Now, remember I said, it's like your eyes are like a window and they shift. So you have to adjust. So it's like at daylight, your pupils uh, die, uh, shrink. So you can actually adjust to the brightness of the light. Same thing happens at night. So our eyes shift. Now what happens is dark unlit areas become darker and bright areas you normalize. So you're actually creating more contrast. And what happens when you have more contrast is that you can't see things as well in the dark uh, that aren't lit. So the solution by the city of Chicago, a lot of times is we need more lights. Um, give you, uh, now there have been uh, a number of studies uh, done about the impact of lighting on crime. A lot of those studies, most of those studies have been done on perception. Now perception is great. Uh, obviously if you were walking, had a choice of walking down a dark street, walking down a lit street, you would probably tell a surveyor, I would rather walk down the bright street, I feel safer. Well, the data doesn't show that it is any safer. I like to point out that when you have a light, it's saying, look here. Now this goes for residential lights as well. Think about that light saying, look here. Um, do you want someone to go, oh, look, a front door. Hmm. Oh, look, a garage door. Or you, you're, you're pointing their attention to it as much as you're pointing your own attention to it. So what they found in this one study is, uh, like I said, there are very few studies done on the um, impact of light pollution on safety. Uh, this was one that was actually quite a, a well done study in 1999 in Chicago where they were looking to do a, a possibly upping the light levels in alleys in Chicago. So they did a one year study of two areas. One they had as a control, one they did increased lights. Um, they went from 50 to 200 watt lights. Um, and what they found was, I don't know if you can see this, the red is before they put uh, with the dark lights, the blue is with the bright lights. There's literally increase in every uh, category of crime they looked at when the lights uh, were brighter. Um, they came out with a few ideas of why this was, but um, I think you could say uh, if you're a criminal, it's dark, you're going to need to see what you're wanting to perpetrate, <laughs> or be it you know a break and entering or stealing a car or something like that. You'd need a light yourself. When you have a light in the dark, as I said, it's saying, look here. So a criminal would need a light to be able to do what they do. And they're saying, look at me. So it's, it's been found that it attracts, uh, light attracts attention um, for both positive and good. And so in this case, uh, you kind of want, well, think of it like this. Um, if the more light you had, the less crime there was, you'd never see any crime during the day. Um, and Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, most um, crimes are actually done during the day. Uh, there's another aspect which is kind of a little more poetic and about light at night, and it's the human experience. Um, this is a cave painting from Lucille France um, that's, uh, I think it's about 14,000 years old. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, known like depictions of so many things. The uh, Lucille caves are incredible. Um, and what you might notice in here are some, there's a bowl, uh, there's some dots, and uh, what we're actually seeing, and it's believed that the stars near the bottom, those three uh, dots are actually the belt of Orion. Up to, uh, uh, upper right of the bowl is the uh, constellation, or the uh, uh, star cluster, the Pleiades, and it kind of dots in the eyes of the bowl would be the Hyades star cluster. 
The only reason we can make that connection is because we can see the stars. We're speaking the same language as we did 14,000 years ago. And we need that language uh, to be able to understand who we are, what we uh, appreciate, and, and how we see the universe. Um, a psychologist uh, um, coined the frame, uh, coined the phrase uh, Noctelador, which is an emotional attachment to or adoration of the night sky. He actually did, uh, this is from William, William Kelly, he does some research um, into um, taking uh, psychological research and uh, sociological research say, into those who um, showed an appreciation or had experience with the night sky and, and uh, looked at what the, the traits that those people say that it inspired and found and also found, as you can see from this quote, you know, there's literally um, a, a, an artistic sensation or or a, a cognitive um, ins inspiration uh, that comes from our experience of the dark, of the night, of, of, of a peaceful environment that quite often we miss uh, because we don't have that experience anymore. So I just want to finish by giving you uh, some tools. Say, okay, you told me all this, but is this problem bigger than all of us? Um, and I, I'd like to say no. Um, now, I gave uh, some of the impacts that light pollution has, and I just kind of want to tell you um, what you can do about it. Uh, give you a little uh, recommendation about um, how to perceive your environment maybe a little differently and how to start thinking about solutions. Um, so this is my little uh, uh, um, way of kind of getting across a, uh, some of the main points of light pollution, and maybe this sticks in your head. I always like to say the what, where, when, and warm. So I'm doing a little riff on the journalistic uh, um, uh, sort of way of thinking. Um, only watt is needed. So only the wattage that is needed. Do you need a 100 watt bulb or would a 10 watt bulb suffice? There's the where. The where is it needed? Is that light shining out into your eyes where it's blinding people and uh, you know driving by or if it's at your house, uh, is it you know making uh, it hard to see the um, the address on your on your house? Is it shining into neighbors' uh, windows? Um, so put that light to where you want it. Always think of the intention. Is this light there to light up the the door so I can put the key in the door, or is this light shining all over the entire front of my house where the important part is just being able to safely enter my door? The when is needed. Now this is timing. Um, I've been doing a, a, a compiling data in Chicago to do a proposal to see if we can actually reduce the light in um, the, that light budget that we, I mentioned is like $20,000 an hour, Chicago. Um, uh, by the way, the lights in Chicago, uh, the street lights turn on. Now this can also, this also applies to house lights as well. The street lights in Chicago turn on when the shine, sun is still shining. Um, multiply that about 350,000 times, it adds up. Um, the when is needed, so only have the light on when it's needed. Um, so for example, if you have um, uh, house lights, out, exterior house lights, um, the best suggestion I would give, motion sensors. Motion sensors are a perfect way, and I, I bet some of you have them. It's a great way to not have you have to click on the light every time and click it off every time, but it's only used when there's something detected, light turns on. And by the way, for safety purposes, um, there's no better deterrent than having a sudden light shine in someone's face for them to react. <clears throat> um, and then the only warm is needed. Uh, now that was that, it's referring to that blue light. Um, when you go to the hardware store or you know, you're gonna buy a new light bulb, and this is for interior lights as well, take a look at what's called the color uh, temperature. Um, you really want a color temperature below what's called 3000 K. Above 3000 K, there's more and more and more blue light. Um, so you might even see a 5000 K light bulb. You're gonna feel like you're in a prison. <laughs> those lights are so white. And when it says white, it means it has a lot of blue on it. All right, so now if you have those four things, 
only uh, the, the wattage, the brightness, the where, the when, and the warm. So let, I'm going to give you one example. See if uh, let's test your your experience here. Now this was outside the Adler Planetarium on a nice foggy night. And when I say nice foggy night, oh, there's no better thing for a, a light pollution researcher than fog because it really shows you where the light is going and what it's doing. So in this case, um, remember I said um, there is the um, the where. Um, oops, wait, let me go back. <laughs> okay, the what? Um, so this light is so bright that if you look in the sides, if you look in the sidewalk that's off the edge, I would, if I was standing right here, I would not be able to identify a person walking down that sidewalk. I would not even be able to see them. The lights are so bright that my, remember that window of your vision, it moved so that I can't see the dark areas on the side. Too bright. Now, what about the, uh, oops, I skipped one. Oh, no, there you go. Um, now, what about the uh, where? Now you see these lights in the front. Oh, they're shining down. You actually can see that they're just lighting the sidewalk. They're not shining in your eye. <clears throat> the old high pressure sodium vapor lamps in the back are just glaring to the side. Look at the color of the sky in this image. This is that thing that we see from space. This is all that energy shooting up. Um, and then you're thinking, what about the when? Here's Copernicus saying, wait a minute, this is late night out on uh, a museum campus. There's literally no one out. Why are there so many lights? <laughs> um, you know, you would think like, oh, let's cut half the lights. If you want to have some lights, fine. Why are we using lights at this time? And then finally, there's the warm. Remember I mentioned that you can see the color in these two different lights. Um, these are LEDs in the front and the ones in the back are uh, high pressure sodium. Those are oranger light. This is the, the older, they're less efficient lights. So we are definitely a lot of, wasting a lot of energy, but these, these new lights in the front are very blue. Uh, they have a lot of blue content. In fact, you can kind of see the color of the scene in the front is greenish. Well, green is yellow and blue together. You know that there's blue light in there. Um, so for you, if you take these lessons, I like to say, start small, start doable, <laughs> do something that you can do, begin at home. And so I hope that what I talked about here will kind of open your eyes. So next time you're walking down uh, your street uh, at night, just be aware of how many lights there really are. Start to kind of think of like, oh, are they shining my face? Are they bluish? Are they a warm light? Why are they still on? Those are the questions you should ask yourself. And you can change the environment in your own home and around your own home yourself. And I think, you know, if you're inspired, hopefully you do um, make those changes. Um, but the next step is maybe spreading the word. Um, you know, you don't want to be the person who's always telling people what to do, but if you inform them, hey, you know what I learned that, uh, you know, bird migration uh, or uh, something that may be concerning to your neighbors, um, uh, something that you know that they're interested in as well, energy savings alone, um, start spreading, spreading the word. And maybe you can, uh, I don't know if you have neighborhood organizations, but maybe they could do the same thing saying, yeah, hey, yeah, let's, let's uh, you know, change the way we light the, our, our porch lights and things like that. Obviously the next step is kind of um, going to making the case to your community, maybe to your town. Um, this is pretty easy to do. Um, obviously, any uh, municipality wants to save money. Um, it's your taxes that are going to it. It's a win-win. If you use less energy, you're paying less money, you're actually saving the environment at the same time. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, joining the world. Uh, the IDA, the Illinois, I mean, the uh, India, I don't know why I keep saying that. the uh, International Dark Sky Association is the largest world advocate for light pollution issues. Um, and you can become a member of the IDA. Just go to darksky.org, uh, look at some of their content they have there. Um, I was mentioning a lot of what I touched on is just a brief introduction. Um, the IDA has so much wonderful content about um, what you can do, the impacts of light pollution, um, and how you can you know, change the light in your own home, how you can protect yourself indoors and outdoors to the negative effects of light pollution. Um, or if you want, um, we are actually on, in the process with a few other folks of trying to form a IDA Chicago chapter, a Chicago regional chapter. So this will encompass everything from Wisconsin to almost the Michigan border, uh, kind of coming across Lake Michigan. We would love your help. If anybody's interested in joining that effort, um, we want to get the word out. Um, and so finally, 
Uh, this is uh, our region from another, in, uh, you can actually, oh, you, you can see Harrington in this one. <laughs> um, if you can identify your town at night, it means something's going wrong. <laughs> You're lighting the universe above you. Um, so I always like to say, it's okay, don't be afraid of the dark. But thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ken, for joining us. Thank Sam, you. do we have any questions? We do have a couple questions that have come in. I am going to actually, I will start with Jennifer's question um, about the effect of light pollution on smog. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there a connection between those? That is interesting you mentioned it uh, because there is one study that was done in Los Angeles where they looked at what's actually um, nitrous oxide production in uh, at night due to light. Um, and they have seen some upticks in, in their research. They definitely need more data. So the preliminary uh, um, information is that there are some chemical compounds in the atmosphere that are triggered by uh, light. Um, it's like I said, very preliminary, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, I am going to send a quick note and I will say it too. Um, if folks would like to type questions in chat, they may. Um, and I will read them out rather than trying to have multiple people um, speaking at once. And apparently I cannot speak and type at the same time. So let me- Well, you know me, Sam, in. I can never keep quiet. <laughs> so, go for it. So I will cover for you while you're uh, typing, but- uh, Here we go. I'm typing and hopefully that helps everybody find the chat. Um, we do have one gentleman who just said, um, excellent presentation, very informative, thank you. We have someone who's asking about um, the push to use LED lights um, mm -hmm. because they don't generate as much heat, that sort of a thing. And is that asking if that is counterproductive? LEDs are an amazing technology that literally like, uh, they, um, they are almost at sometimes 10 times more efficient than, for example, we're talking, if I just talk street lights, um, you know, those old high pressure sodiums or even incandescent bulbs in a house, you'll know definitely, I would always say go LED for energy savings. Um, that's where that recommendation about getting warm LEDs is very important because um, it was really the production of the blue LEDs that made them um, commercially viable because old LEDs are very red. Um, and people were like, well, this is too red. I don't want this in my house or outside. Um, but then with the uh, introduction of blue LED technology, we were able to get what we consider a white light. Um, so the energy efficiency of LEDs will uh, we, you know, surpass anything we have um, to date. But it's how it's used, and like I said, and it's color. There is a thing, uh, I, I deal a lot with street lights um, when it comes to outdoor lighting. Um, and you definitely have the option. Uh, there are warm LEDs. So like I said, if, you, if you're gonna do some outdoor lights at your house, look for a warm LED. Uh, like I said, 3000 K, uh, Kelvin, uh, 3000 Kelvin or below. So if you find one that's 1800 or 2200, oh, go for it. Um, so they're gonna be efficient and the colors gonna be right. And, and so the key is also using that light in the right way. If it's if you have the most efficient light in the world, but it's shining up, you're you're not um, gaining the uh, benefit of that energy efficiency. Okay, thank you. I know I recently mm -hmm. replaced uh, light uh, track lighting that had halogen bulbs in it with warm LED. And first off, I'm not nearly as warm when I'm in that room with those lights on anymore, <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. much more restful. Um, we have a question, and this might be a little tough to answer without looking at, you know, s directly at statistics, but just asking about the comparison between Cook County and Berlin. Um, does Berlin mm -hmm. if you were to take like the Chicagoland area relative to Berlin? Does that population, um, how similar are those populations numbers? Uh, it's actually very similar here. I'm going to, um, I'll keep my... I, I, it was funny when I was doing that, uh, I had to screen, 
still trying to figure out how can Zoom can work while you're screen sharing and see your notes. Um, so uh, here, I will pull that up. Um, I'm glad you asked. Okay, so this is why it's a good comparison. Um, so Chicago has, I, I actually showed on the thing, Cook County versus Berlin Metro, which is um, a similar uh, geographic size. Um, Berlin Metro has 4.5 million. Cook County has 5.2 million. So we're within, we're less, you know, less than a million difference. Um, the city of Chicago has 2.7 million. The city of Berlin has 3.7 million. So literally there's more concentration of population in Berlin than the outskirts. So it, it drops off much more. We have a much more spread out environment here in Chicago. Um, so, and then just to give you an idea, they're both about Cook County and what's called Berlin. Brandon is about, um, they're both about 4,000 square kilometers. So very similar in size as well. Okay. So hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> I think it, it's a little bit if you go out, so if you include like Lake County, Kane County, mm -hmm. that sort of a thing. But even looking at the map behind you, it looks significantly less bright when you get mm -hmm. further out from the city, which is where those, I mean, where those other suburbs are located. Um, so mm -hmm. I know the person who's asked that question, Christine, we can, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say your name out loud. We can look at it um, at the library. I can pull up some uh, census data for you to kind of compare those. So we'll take a look at it. Um, I think- And by the way, I'd be happy if you wanted to share my email address I had in there. Uh, if, if anybody sure. wants to send me an you know, email, um, I'll try to do the best I can to answer some of these questions, maybe more in depth if there was follow-up. And... Sure. So I think what we'll do is um, we will, once we've got the, the, the recording is rendered and we've had a chance to save it, I will send a copy of it to the folks who are registered and I will include your email address with that if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Um, any other, oh, we had one question that was about the effects of um, excess light on fish. Uh, yes, oh, actually there's a, um, incredible, if, if you, um, Search for um, Lake Lab. <laughs> Lake Lab is a, um, a an ongoing research project uh, in Germany, where they're doing exactly that. They've literally created these giant in this lake these giant ecosystems that they illuminate at different uh, illuminations, and they have found one of the one of the main things they've found is that um, uh, like zooplankton's and other things that the fish um, survive on um, when there's a lot of light, too much light. They actually don't come up. They're they're looking to protect themselves of dark. And then what happens is that population gets thinner. It's and once again this is a food chain uh, event, and they have found that it weakens the um, uh, the fish populations. And it's very similar to like you know the effect that we had from the mayflies, where when um, a uh, that um, choke point of a food chain is diminished it has many downstream effects. Um, so yeah, they have found uh, a lot of direct uh, um, oh, effects. And then also uh, salmon, uh, spawning salmon. Uh, a lot of um, areas in the Northwest will have illuminated bridges over rivers that the salmon spawn on. And they have actually found that it disrupts uh, their, um, their mating cycle and their, also their uh, migration cycles too. So lights going directly into waters. In fact, I, there's a movement now to try to eliminate down lit bridges, you might see this is kind of a trend I know in Europe specifically is they'll, they'll have all these down lit bridges so they you're literally lighting the water and it has very um, direct uh, impacts to uh, fish populations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a question as well about, um, you know, on that you said start with yourself, then your friends and neighbors, your community, and then the world. Where do all the office buildings in Chicago that leave their lights on all the time, where do they fit in that? <laughs> when should yeah, you that's that? a good that's a good question. Um, you know, it's it violates all those four things that I mentioned, the you know, the what, where, what, and warm. Um, and yes, I mean, this is where I think there's a, let me just say the the one success story. Um, there's a thing called Lights Out Chicago, which if you're if you're a bird enthusiast, you've probably heard of it. Um, it's an effort to um, uh, have during the height of migration season, in the spring and the fall, to have uh, buildings downtown lower their lights or even 
turn off their lights um, to try to mitigate the, the uh, damage from in, during bird migration and the mortality of, of many birds uh, during the, heat, uh, the height of uh, migration. Um, it's an effort. I mean, it could always be supported. The, the Chicago um, Ornithological, Ornithological Association, the Audubon Society, I know work very um, uh, strongly in those field, uh, in that effort. Um, there's a thing called FLAP, uh, um, which is the Fatal Light Awareness Program. Uh, I think it's out of Ontario, um, which has had a lot of success moving. Uh, and this is, it, it's actually a small organization that's done a lot uh, to uh, help mitigate those things. I, it's it's really a community effort. Um, you know, I think the solution might be, you know, uh, in your mind as well as, you know, what we have and what others have tried to do. If it's a yep, community effort or a governmental effort. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And then one last one. While you were speaking, you mentioned briefly that one of the pictures you took was at Middle Fork, which is a dark sky park. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what a dark sky park is. Oh, oh, I'm glad you mentioned it because um, a dark sky park is the uh, International Dark Sky Association um, about 20 years ago um, came up with a way to um, try to protect dark areas uh, and protect the night, night environment in um, areas that um, are pristine or have the effort to um, keep their um, environment at night safe to protect the night skies and protect the nighttime environment. So they've come up with a number of designations, everything from dark sky reserve to um, dark sky parks. So the first dark sky park in all of Illinois, um, which is a they, they, uh, the plan to become a dark sky park is you have to commit to uh, the uh, lighting policy within your area. You have to show stewardship. Uh, you have to outreach. You have to try to get the idea of uh, pristine uh, nights out there to the public. You have to invite the public to experience uh, a, a night uh, environment. So Middle Fork, um, uh, Middle Fork Forest Preserve, I think it is. Um, it's near Champaign is Illinois' first dark sky park. Um, and just to let you know, uh, from working with our students for the last, uh, you know, I work with a lot of high school students. Um, let's see if I can show you on this. There is a big dark area right here <laughs> near Chicago. Yeah. It happens to be um, the, if you're familiar with Little Red Schoolhouse, it happens to be the area, um, a forest preserve from Cook County Forest Preserves. Uh, it's a 6,600 acre area and we are in the process, thanks to all the data our teens have um, got over the last, uh, uh, well, 12 months to help support the first, what's called an urban night sky place designation. So um, it's a, a designation from the IDA recognizing that you're not going to see the Milky Way in, in a place next to such, uh, a city like ours. Um, but it's amazing. We've done surveys. They literally have five lights in, in an area that's 6,600 acres wide. If you want to see a night that is beautiful, uh, well, hopefully uh, you can always go to <laughs> go there in the evening, uh, but we're going to try to, with this um, application, extend the ability for the public to go at night. So that's great. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I um, pulled up the uh, darksky.org um thank you regarding middle middle fork river middle fork river forest preserve specifically That's it. So, <laughs> yeah. yes forgot to yeah. Yeah. a little bit of a tongue twister there um so thank you i know my first experience with seeing the milky way was about 15 years ago i spent oh. 10 days um at an indian reservation native american reservation in wyoming and yeah outside one night and looked up and went oh is there a little bit of clouds up there and they were like no yeah. that that's the milky way I'm like Oh, mm -hmm. so it is quite stunning if any of you get a chance to see it. I will give one last call. I know we have a couple of different um, local astronomy groups that joined us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have any questions they'd like to pose. Although again, they are familiar with a lot of this, so maybe not. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that looks like we did you, are all- Do you want me to uh, address Jennifer's question as well? I see she had- Did, we, did I miss one? I'm so sorry. Um, something about lowering light at night and the body's response to cancer drugs. Is oh that yeah, that was early on. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I so yeah, uh, Jennifer, you asked about um, there was a study that was done in um, 
a longitudinal study, which um, uh, which looked at followed uh, 100,000 night shift workers, uh, women, uh, in their primarily, in their primarily um, and tracked them for decades. And what they did was uh, they they looked at um, incidences of breast cancer, and then also efficacy of the treatment to breast cancer. So this relates to that melatonin production. They found that night shift workers who had almost a 24 hour exposure to light, um, you know, throughout their, uh, their night and, you know, they um, had a significant um, decrease in the uh, effective treatment um, and the incidences of breast cancer as well. So um, now, you know, this was a, it was a, it was a large study and there's epidemiologists who are trying to follow up um, and uh, oncologists who are trying to follow up to see if they can do more similar research to confirm some of those um, uh, findings. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to um, turn back on the video just for a moment for myself and for Jennifer so we can say they are farewells. So mm -hmm. thank you so, so much for being with us. This was really interesting. We really appreciate it. I'm getting that feedback from a lot of folks in the comments as well, that they really enjoyed it and learned a lot. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And thank you. So we can all do the little, if you go to your Zoom window, you can do <laughs> actions, you can clap. If you can. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Thank and thank you everyone who yeah. joined in tonight and, uh, and listened. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.